Shalom, friends. Last time on Unapologetic Slight, we were discussing the virginity test in Deuteronomy 22, and a Muslim apologist by the name of Nadir Ahmed, who believes that this is a scientific error. If you are interested in our refutation of Mr. Ahmed on this particular passage, please do check out our Unapologetic Slight on the issue. Today, we will be continuing our series refuting the so-called scientific errors in the Bible put forward by Nadir Ahmed. What we will be addressing today is the most common of alleged scientific errors put forward against the Bible, and that is the size of the mustard seed. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 32, and elsewhere in Luke and also in Mark, we see, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, the scoffing scholar, or anybody else interested in scoffing at the Bible, will quickly point out that, as a matter of fact, the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. Therefore, when Matthew 13 and 32 says, which indeed is the least of all seeds, it is in scientific error. To hear this from the mouth of Nadir Ahmed himself, here we have a short clip from his debate with a Christian apologist by the name of Sahi Luke. So the Bible says that the mustard seed is the smallest seed that you plant into the ground. Okay? And we know that's not true. We know that there are orchid seeds which are even smaller. Okay, it says over here, and there's another reference which is actually found inside uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. It says, and the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which is a man that, that, uh, that uh, took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it's, uh, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the, and so it, it says that it's the smallest of all seeds. It says the smallest seed you plant in the ground, but we know from science today that is not true. Uh, we know that there are many seeds which are actually smaller. So what's very interesting is the mustard seed analogy is actually given in the Quran, inside chapter 21, verse 47. It says over there that, um, it, says over, it says over there, and we place the scales of justice for the day of resurrection. So no soul will be treated unjustly at all. And if there is even the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it forth. Now notice what's not in the Quran. You got it, it that it is the smallest seed that you plant in the ground. So here we see that the mustard seed analogy is actually used in the Quran, but the scientific error is missing from the Quran. And so he So, there you heard it from Nadir Ahmed's own mouth. The Quran corrects the so-called scientific error found not only in Matthew 13, but also in Mark, 31, Mark 4, 31, and Luke 13, 19. He says that this is a clear example of the Quran coming forward and correcting errors that have been placed into the Bible, whether by conspiracy or by accident. I guess we don't know. Now, there are a few things here that we definitely need to address when refuting Mr. Ahmed. First and foremost, what we definitely need to grant is yes, the mustard seed, as you can see by the size comparison here, is larger than some other known seeds. For example, the orchid. Here we see the poppy seed. And of course, there is other ones here as well. Now, this doesn't actually matter for a person like Nadir Ahmed because as it turns out, Islam affirms the gospel. Here we see Surah 7 and 156. We will also be reading 157. Quote, And decree for us in this world that which is good, and also in the hereafter. Indeed, we have turned back to you. Allah said, My punishment, I afflict with it whom I will, but my mercy encompasses all things. So I will decree it especially for those who fear me and give zakah, and those who believe in our verses. Let's go down to 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in what they have of the Torah and the gospel, 
who enjoins upon them what is right and forbids them what is wrong and makes lawful for them the good things and prohibits for them the evil and relieves them of their burden and their shackles which were upon them. So they who have believed in him, honored him, supported him, and followed the light which was sent down with him. It is those who will be successful. Notice that at the beginning of verse 157, we see those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in what they have of the Torah and the gospel. Now, for those of you who do not know, the gospel refers specifically to the four gospel books of the New Testament, while the Torah refers specifically to the first five books of the Old Testament. And here we see in sort of 7, 156 through 157, clear and unambiguous affirmation of the Torah and the gospel as they existed in Arabia in Muhammad's time. But we have copies of the Bible from all across the world during Muhammad's time. And as it turns out, they all say the exact same things in this particular regard. So we happen to have the Torah and the gospel that would have been found amongst the people of Arabia. And what do we find in those Gospels? We find Luke 13, 19, Mark 4, 31, and Matthew 13, 31 through 32. This is not the only place where Islam explicitly and unambiguously affirms the Gospels. For example, we see here in Surah 547, and let the people of the Gospel, that would be Christians, judge by what, has, by what Allah has revealed therein. Let's say that again. And let the people of the gospel, remember the gospel means the first four books of the New Testament, three of those four include the mustard seed parable, and let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. So you see, my friends, as a Christian, if you judge by something other than the gospel, as it was revealed in Muhammad's time, which happens to be the same thing as the gospel that we have today, then you are indeed among those who are defiantly disobedient, at least according to the Quran. So, when Mr. Ahmed says, I am going to go ahead and reject this particular portion of the gospel, I think it is inaccurate, scientifically speaking, and I also think it is not what Jesus said, so on and so forth, he is telling us, Christians, to be among those who are defiantly disobedient and directly contradicting that which is in his own scriptures. But, you may ask, that doesn't necessarily do anything about the actual question. Sure, Nadir Ahmed is definitely misguided in the fact that he attacks things which his religion demands him to affirm, but the point does still stand, does it not? Is this a scientific error in the Bible. Quickly, we will find that it is not. Let's go back to Matthew 13, 31 really quick. Another parable put he forth unto them. Let me say that again. Another parable put he forth unto them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, according to the dictionary, a parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. This is from Google's dictionary. We can go to Merriam-Webster's dictionary and we find a usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or a religious principle. Also, something such as a news story or a series of real events likened to a parable in providing an instructive example or lesson. But perhaps we don't like this particular definition either. So, one more time, we will go to a separate source, a third source now. The Bible does say, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a matter be established. And here we are at dictionary.com. A short, allegorical story designed to illustrate or teach some truth, religious principle, or moral lesson. Or, a statement or comment that conveys a meaning indirectly by the use of comparison, analogy, or the like. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, this parable does not have to be scientifically accurate 
There is absolutely nothing that requires a parable to be scientifically accurate because it is an allegorical and fictitious story for the point of teaching some sort of religious or philosophical truth. This parable is no more inaccurate in calling the mustard seed the least of all seeds than it is inaccurate in calling the kingdom of heaven a literal mustard seed, which of course it is not. It is a parable, an allegory, used to describe the faith that it takes in the person in order to reach the kingdom of heaven. But of course, there's even more to talk about. Because as it turns out, even if this was meant to be taken literally, it would still not be scientifically inaccurate. The mustard seed is undoubtedly the smallest crop seed which would have been known by the Jews at that time. Therefore, when speaking to the Jews at that time, it would not be inaccurate for anybody to say, this is the least of the seeds, because if you were to say, actually, the least of the seeds is an orchid, nobody would have any idea what you're talking about, right? The least of the seeds which are planted in the ground by Jews at that time would be the mustard seed. And this is plainly obvious to anybody who studies the history of the time. Furthermore, the context of these verses very clearly implies that we are to be using specifically crop seeds and even more specifically herbs. We see here an inter interlinear. I'm going to be reading the English portion of it, so it's going to sound a little bit weird, but in Mark 4.31 we see, as to a grain of mustard, which when it has been sown upon the earth, smallest is of all the seeds which are upon the earth. And of course, you can see all the different Greek words there, and the link will be in the description below. Notice the context is very clearly when it has been sown in the earth. Notice the context is clearly speaking about things which are grown by farmers. We see this once again in Luke 13 and 19. Like it is to a grain of mustard, which having taken a man cast into, gar into garden, uh, into his garden, sorry, it is weird to read it when it's interlinear. And it grew and came into a tree, and the birds of the air encamped in the branches of it. Once again, what are we seeing here? It's being cast into a garden. It is a crop seed, right? And in fact, we can even look in particular at some of the words here being used. For example... If we were to look here at the word gay, spelt G-E here, and very, very, you know, different spellings in the Greek language because, of course, they have a completely different alphabet, we quickly see that this word implies things like soil. The earth, soil, land, region, country, inhabitants of a region. In this context, it is obvious it is discussing soil. Why is it obvious that it is discussing soil? Because we are currently talking about farming. We also go down here to the word spermaton, which you may actually know this word from some other things in health and or botany class. Notice that it comes from the word sperma, which has a usage of that which is sown seed commonly of cereals clearly the context is not discussing all seeds but all seeds which are grown at that time by the jews of that time lastly but not leastly birds do perch in mustard seed trees sorry in uh, mustard bushes would be the better way to say that so in conclusion we find here Islam affirms the gospel, and so Nadir Ahmed has absolutely no ground to stand on in criticizing anything from the gospels. We also see that this is a parable, and therefore it is not required to be scientifically accurate, and that the comparison of this seed with being the least seed is no more scientifically inaccurate than the comparison of calling the kingdom of heaven a mustard seed in the first place. We also see that this is literally the smallest crop seed that any Jews would have known at the time, and that the context, with words like spermaton and gay, clearly imply 
farming and not just general use of seeds. We also see, just for fun, that indeed, when it becomes like a tree, the birds do perch in it. The last thing I want to note is Mr. Ahmed claims that the Quran actually corrects the Bible in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, when a book appears some 600, if not more, years after the original, claiming to correct anything, that is not correction, that is copying. It is forgery. And we need to understand that indeed, the Quran is nothing more than a collection of other people's fables, religious stories, and histories, and has almost nothing original to itself. Love you guys lots, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and next time we will be addressing Nadir Ahmed's opinions on alcohol, and whether or not the Bible is scientifically inaccurate in the way it deals with alcohol. Shalom.